For instance, after the Twilight series came out, a whole slew of vampire-related TV shows and movies appeared. All this from some fairies frolicking in the forest. Hard to spot the connection, really. Producers noted what made money, then rushed out projects to cash in on the popular subject matter. Since we're not as saturated with vampire media these days, we must be talking about what took its place. Apocalypse. While I blame the Mayan calendar for making this a focus, there are some great stories that came from this concept, and they usually have two flavors, natural disaster and social dysfunction. Either the environment or a society become unbalanced, and the audience gets to ride along with the protagonist as they struggle to survive against a system or forces of nature trying to end them. Makes for fantastic character pieces. So seeing this formula work so well, a producer said to himself, why don't we have a man-made natural disaster flick which results in dystopia? What did we get? Snowpiercer. Chris Evans' vehicle from 2013, it tells the story of an ice age induced by man's attempt to stop global warming. Damn you, global warming! Even when we fix you, we lose! And how the only people to survive it are aboard an over-engineered train that runs eternally along a track that encircles the globe. They're saved from the frozen conditions by a train that crosses every continent. We follow the exploits of the freeloaders in the tail section and how they try to make their way to first class. It's a pretty linear plot, but given the rails the story is on, where else could it go? Well, you'd be surprised. Even a train has curves along its route. Well, let's ride the Snowpiercer and hope that the conductor doesn't throw us out into the snow. Meet Curtis, the face of the freeloaders. He's one of those that were fortunate enough to get on this train with the eternal motion engine when the temperatures began to drop. However, he didn't have the money to actually buy a ticket, since I'm guessing they were quite spendy at the time. Wait, would they be? You'd assume that underground shelters would actually get the most funding for protection against the long winter to come, because then you have geothermal heat and you can actually get away from that surface cold. My last thought would be getting on a train that never stops driving around the whole world. Why? <laughs> High speed plus thick ice equals destruction. Trust me, I've driven through a lot of Midwest winters. The people on the train are divided into three classes. First class, economy, and while I guess you're here, we shouldn't throw you out. They treat this last class with the utmost respect and dignity Two, as well. Three, four, five, six, keep going. Life as a prisoner with no hope of parole is better than freezing to death. That's what the motivational poster says anyway. Warms the heart. What this illustrates beautifully is the dismissive attitudes those higher up in the caste system feel about the people in the lower rungs. In this dysfunctional society, the ticket you came on board with, or lack thereof, defines your permanent station aboard. What was once the luck of which boarding pass you could afford on that day turned into your preordained fate in the new world. This is how cults operate. Proof of concept. The man who created this train was in his day a businessman obsessed with making the perfect locomotive, which just so happened to be the perfect solution once this ice crisis hit. So you'd think that instead of, you know, being a complete and utter tool about controlling the resource, he would say, hey, all who can come aboard are welcome to, instead of charging people. But instead, he made himself into... From a very young age, Mr. Wilford's love of locomotives was apparent. When I grow up, I'm going to trade forever. Forever! God on Earth, savior of all mankind. Messiah Complex, anyone? Okay, so if he didn't make this train true, the large portion of the population would have perished, but... If we ever go outside the train, we all freeze and die. If the engine stops running, We'd all die! There's no need to rub everyone's nose in it. It's transparent what he's trying to create here. How does he expect no one to see this? My god, they're catching up to the plan! Initiate Operation Theta! You pulled my job! Question is how we get that many hamsters. The people who didn't purchase a ticket don't even get windows, just steel walls and protein bars. Enough to survive for the inevitable counts. They're not living, they're enduring. Barely. This film takes place 18 years after the cold snap started, and in that time, at least three revolts have occurred. Those in the back with no supplies charged forward to try and take over. How did that go? To demonstrate, let's use a scene where people without guns try to charge people with guns. Yeah! 
Too often the victory goes to those with better toys. Poor samurai. Curtis and his revolutionaries symbolized those groups without the means that the higher class people can afford, instead relying on cunning, manpower, and force to turn the odds in their favor. Even an empty hand can turn into a fist, and they use theirs to force their way through the tail section barricades. It's a classic scenario. Take people in a desperate situation and dangle hope just out of reach and watch as they twist in ways you couldn't even imagine to grab at it. <sighs> this story loves laying its message on a couple layers thick, and here it's really showing how the human spirit is going to conquer over anything you put in front of it, even other human beings. Since their barrel battering ram needs to stay put as their giant foot in the door, Curtis knows they need a good plan on how to get past the rest of the doorways. His plan is named Namgun Minsu, a recently imprisoned man who helped engineer the train. He was put away because of his obsession with a hallucinogen, one that's a byproduct of the process of the train that coincidentally has a weird effect when you do this kind of thing with it. So Curtis gets a whole box of the stuff to try and say, hey, every time you open a door, you get one of these lumps of chronal. It wouldn't be motivation to anyone else, but this guy's an addict, so it's pretty cut and dried. Or at least it would be, but it actually goes a lot deeper than that because this is very well written as a character piece. Let me bring in the DM to help explain why. Okay, so that's 34 successes on their gunfire. Let's see you dodge. That. 40. Oh, hoo -hoo! I'm gonna make armor out of this chain link fence. It's so awesome. I hate you. It's been two months. Back is still isn't dead. Dead? I still haven't hit him. So, it's the magical face keeping me alive. I'm taking it wherever I go. I'm gonna wrap myself up in it like a blanket. It's gonna be fantastic. I'll be like a giant fat cannoli. Calm down. Why don't you just take a break and tell me about Snowpiercer? Doing happy dates. Which happy part? Dates. The addict engineer. Oh, yeah. The, uh, Deus Ex Namgu. I guess you could make his name more complicated if you really want to. But you're chaotic neutral. Namgu has all the knowledge the mutineers need to reach the front of the train. And <laughs> none of the drive to get there. He only cares about two things. His daughter, and Cronal. Every time they wanted to open a door, you need to give him another hit of the green stuff. So, why chaotic neutral? His drives are completely different than those of everyone else that he's working with. I mean, the only reason he is helping them at all is because they have the Play-Doh that he wants. Totally selfish and willing to do anything to get his fix. I wonder if most addicts are chaotic neutral. He balances out the alignment of the cast. The great designer of the train is lawful evil. The only thing he cares about is keeping the train running, regardless of the cost. Why? If he doesn't, he truly believes humanity will die. I know where he's coming from, alright? A lot of times, players don't know what's best for him. Somebody's gotta be the father. So since the creator's lawful evil, the revolt must be led by lawful good, right? Well, if this was a boring campaign structure, then yes. Uh, but Snowpiercer likes to have the more nuanced approach to it, with complex heroes. Chaotic good, neutral good, and neutral evil. We have a peppering of every exciting alignment you can imagine throughout the main cast. Their backstories twist and weave an intricate tale that, once you understand it, is fantastic. It's realistic in that there really is no lawful good. Just shades of disturbed, of the downtrodden, beaten by the horrible dictatorship that runs the train. Snowpiercer has plausible psyches within its characters and gives reason for the depth. Thanks for showcasing that, DM. Anytime! You Not know what? I was getting tired of holding this fence. I just throw it aside and leap at the bad guys. Seven! Beat that! Alright, that'll be easy enough. I Yeah, it's a one. Huh. Must have been the fence after all. So, Bacchus, pop quiz. You ever been hamburger meat before? No. Well, first time for everything. So the players are in place and the story is in motion. It seems like I'm rushing quite a lot of exposition past you. Believe me, I'm doing half of what the film does. This is a strange case because I had to watch this movie twice before I could actually enjoy it. That first time I was trying to grab every detail it spat out at me and I just got overwhelmed. So I'll summarize. Everything in this movie, as ridiculous as it is, does have a logical explanation. Don't try to hurt yourself figuring it out in the first go through. If you look for an explanation for each moment, trust me, you'll eventually find your answers, though not right away. Lines in the very beginning are explained once the characters have completed their journey, after they've been beset by betrayal, setbacks, and... What was the purpose of that car? 
Believe it or not, this movie does eventually explain most of itself, though many viewers won't have the two-hour patience required for the payoff. The longest walk along the train ever comes with gritty action, soft moments, and mountains of social commentary. Those people living in the back are painted as ungodly, hideous beasts to those people up front because the guards are the only ones to interact with them. They have no idea what they're like. And those people in the back, well, they see everyone up front as these snooty, ah, we'd rather have them die than be in our way attitudes when there might actually be some people who are on their side. They just can't communicate because there's more than metal between them. There is a cultural barrier that will not shift. And they all seem to forget one basic fact. They're all on this train together. While there is a shared ceremonious occasion where the two sides stop mid-battle to celebrate New Year's Day, trust me, it's weirder than it sounds. These people seem to have forgotten that they all came on the board at the same time. Despite their physical different locations on the train, they're all from the same doomed planet. Take away the dividing walls and the locomotive, and they're all just survivors, trying to make the best of a terrible situation. The whole film dissects how awful people can treat one another, and yet how the strong bonds can form under these extreme conditions. It's a great way of showing the temperament that exists between groups across all times and ages. Which is why the ending felt a bit... underwhelming. I'm not gonna go into why this is, but- Ooh! Ah, the scary Kelvin from the fridge! And I was gonna spoil the snow presser! You be warned! Why, why would you spoil that? It's got nothing to do with human behavior. So, what are you talking about? It's got everything to do with what the people do. Snowpiercer couldn't happen if the people didn't try to fix something way outside their control. Like the change in the global temperatures, yo. When the chemicals stop global warming in its tracks by introducing a new ice age, the expedition assumes that all life went extinct outside the train of the Ark. But that's what happened. No, yo, look at the ending. It spells it all out, yo. After the train stopped and the survivors take in a cold landscape surrounding, what do they see? See? It's right there, yo. It's right there. It's that white thing, you know? Standing in the field with the white field, you know? It's hard to see. I can see it because it's, 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 it's like white on white, but, but it's dead, trust me. A polar bear. In the mountains. It's confusing. It's a sign that people were wrong. Come on. We learned this in class. What would be the first thing to go in a mass extinction event? Large complex organisms like predators. Yes, apex predators. And if the apex predators like the polar bears are still alive, then that logically must mean... The smaller creatures it eats. No matter how much people think they change things for better or for worse, yo, life still finds a way to all of humanity's doings, yo. It's like, even though the planet ain't safe for humans anymore, that don't mean other things can't survive. So the literal derailing at the end of the film is just a subtle way of saying that all of our actions are totally inconsequential to the world we stand upon. We affect each other way more permanently than we affect the earth that we stand on. The next Ice Age is going to prove that. You really opened my eyes here. Thank you, Kelvin. Speaking of which, uh, you might want to get a coat, a uh, big fur coat, because uh, uh, next year's going to be a cold one. <laughs> I can't wait. Did you say something about code ones? Yeah, give me some, Marcus! Alright. People become so involved with their petty battles between social groups that they forget a major thing. There's a world beyond the train. We have problems within our structures, and there's areas for improvement in how we interact with one another. But at the end of the day, we're still sentient beings working to survive in an unforgiving environment. The whole reason people banded together in the first place, aside from breeding, was survival. We were cold, so we made fire. It was windy, we reformed wood to block out the wind. That thing was a little fast, we pulled a string taut, fired something after it. Groups were made so we could survive against the elements that are always trying to tear us down. And once we conquered those basic needs, we started escalating. Once bands became tribes, then city-states, and then countries, the whole purpose behind the group became fuzzy. As our perspectives broadened, our focus on differences grew. Snowpiercer illustrates what these harsh divides between people will result in if our darkest hour comes. Total destruction of humanity as the world shrugs and moves on. If all those train tickets had instead said general boarding pass, they could have avoided this entire dilemma. That's the boarding system I'm going to use for my apocalypse-proof helicopter, actually. But what did I think of this train ride? Well worth the price. The story is told in a very natural way. No one sits and over-explains to one another why this train functions the way it does, because it's clear they've all lived on it for decades. These lives show us heartache, wonder, suspense, and above all, a 
morally gray question left for the audience to answer. That's what a good movie should leave us with. If you haven't taken the ride yet, I'd suggest giving Snowpiercer a go. Otherwise, you'll just have to wait for me to iron out the kinks in my helicopter design. I still can't figure out how to make it work in space. I'm the other socio, and you all have a ticket to ride.